senators, with uh, members of parliament, other uh, operatives of the party, really getting on track and coming out swinging and fighting. Because you see, we can stand here in, on, on these um, platforms and other places, and we can say a lot of things and complain. But if we don't do that, then the issues get left aside. So we have to raise issues. As we see them, when we see them, we will expose them. Because they are wicked, incompetent government. And that is our job, as I see, as an opposition, as a government in waiting. And there are so many issues now. You really, when you have to speak, you don't know where to start. Others have spoken, talking about the collapse of one sector or the other. But it is true what MP Padarat said. Everything has collapsed. The energy sector has collapsed. The economy has collapsed. The health sector has collapsed. The education sector has collapsed. And it looked like some of them in the government collapsing too. So we are here to raise issues with you. There's so many things we can talk about. The, the increase in crime, increase in unemployment, the shutting down of businesses. You know, you, I think pe many people wake up in the morning wondering by the end of the day if they will still have a job. Will I still have a job? Will I still be able to care for my family? Many of us as MPs, as senators, as activists, we receive numerous calls. We receive so many emails, text messages, people coming into the offices, and the level of suffering I have never seen. In all my years in the politics, I've never seen the level of suffering amongst the ordinary citizens in our country as we are witnessing today. In every level, in every place, whether it's in North, the South, the East, the West, or even in Tobago, everywhere. But the government would have you believe things are going hunky-dory. You know why? Because things are going hunky-dory for them. They're getting all the tax exemptions, but none for you. This month, so many measures Imsbud came with from the budget last year have come into effect. Tax measures in this month of January. The US car market. They've crippled that market, but do you know what it means as well? That an ordinary citizen who could afford it, one of these foreign news vehicles are now out of that market. Out of that market, left out, you know. A, a person, a young person, a not so young person, when you get a job, there are two things you think about. Well, maybe it's three. You think about getting married and raising a family. You think about caring for that family. You think about getting a car to move about, to go to work, to take your children to school. And you think about owning a house. These are basic things to care for your family, raise your children, have a place to rest your head, have a car. It doesn't have to be a massive car, you know. They gave themselves all these huge exemptions, but they come on the foreign use market where ordinary people could have accessed a vehicle. So in everything, you have seen Janty spoke, others spoke about the stranded nationals. I think this thing has become, it has become totally untenable. We must raise a hue and cry. Because I'll tell you something, you know, whilst we talk about people can't come home. And look, I have no jealousy or envy about those who allow their daughter to come back and their son to come back and for a minister to fly out on an MP fly. I have no problem with that. But it must be fair and it must be equitable that every citizen must have that chance. It cannot be you have a policy that favors some against the other. And we'll talk more about that because I don't know and I want Stuart Young to tell us tonight. Well, he wouldn't tell me tonight, but I want him to tell us when I raise it tonight. Where do you get the power from? Under which law you have the jurisdiction and the power to prevent a citizen from returning to Trinidad and Tobago? And is it true? Whereas before people will apply for an exemption to come home, is it true now that once they get onto an aircraft with no exemption, that once they land here, they will be let in? Because the law is very clear, you cannot refuse the right of entry to a citizen who lands here. And now I'm being told people are coming on flights without the exemption, and once they land, you cannot send them back. 
because they are citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. It's the Constitution. You cannot refuse entry to a citizen. So are there some people who are finding a way around all this nonsense you put into place, all this blockade you put into place, but some few have contacts are complicit with others that they could board an aircraft, land here, and say, well, look, you have to let them in. Is that happening? I am told that previously you apply for the exemption, then you get flights. We are being told now that you are booking flights. And when you reach here, the airline gets in the exemption for you. Tell us if these things are true and why, Stuart. Why did you shut down the computer systems, shut down access to the immigration officers, to the computer systems? Why? When you let Delcy in here earlier last year, we got the manifest, we presented it because people were so upset that you let in a sanctioned person with a group of sanctioned other persons on a sanctioned aircraft. You let them in secretly, thinking no one would find out. But it came out, and immediately after that, I am told that you shut down access to the computer systems in immigration at the airport. You shut it down. I am told you blocked out all the senior people in immigration, and you have three or four junior people in immigration having access to those computers. Why? Who is coming that we don't know about? Who else is coming here that we don't know about because you've shut down the system? Why did you shut it down, and what are you bringing? Up to today, we want to know what Delcy brought on that sanctioned aircraft. We want to know what they brought. And why they were allowed to walk about Port of Spain to go shopping. Why have you shut down the computers? Well, not the computer, but access to the computer. And you're giving it only to some favored junior people. The senior people in immigration have been blocked out from using the system. I think it's only a day or two now. They've been allowed on, one or two of them, but again, to blocked, blocked information. So you see, Stuart, the truth will always come out. So no matter what you block and how much you block, it's going to come out just like how Delcy came out, just like other relatives of other people. As I say in the UNC, I have no problem. We have no problem. I'm happy for them. Happy you could come and spend time with your family. What about the others? Many have spoken about them tonight. Let me ask you something. What about this lady? What is her name? Ariel. Young Ariel. She started a, a donation page to fund her quarantine expenses in St. Lucia. What about all the others who have no money to fund where they are for food and shelter and clothing? No compassion for those people. And then what happens when their family here go to the banks, you line up and you go week after week, day after day, to get what? $200. If you're lucky, you get $200. And these people have been locked up now going 10 months, 11 months. What is the rationale? What is your thinking? Give us a reason why you're denying citizens the right to come home, you know? You and Faris are always in the parliament talking about northern construction and proportionate and whatever it is, the aim must be legitimate and, and proportionate. Where is the proportionality in blocking citizens? Where is the proportionality when it is you have other ways in which you can deal with the same issue? This is what is happening in other countries. You do the test, you do the test, then they check you, quarantine if you need to be quarantined. You have other proportionate measures, your favorite words. How many times have you told us about that? So when you come to breach people's rights, if there are other legitimate aims and means proportionate to the action that you're taking and to the result that you want, then there's no need to do what you're doing. What is your rationale? Barbados has their borders open. People told you that. Jamaica, every civilized country and not so civilized, their borders are open. Why are you blocking people from coming in to their own country? And so we have more to say on this, you know. This now has become an issue that is not simply to do with Stuart Young saying, I will bring you in, I will not bring you in. I want you to tell me which law. I want you to look at the Immigration Act. Where does it say that you can do this? If you're going to do it, you bring it for parliamentary scrutiny. You've never brought that. You've never brought your exemption policy to the parliament for scrutiny. 
Is it under the Public Health Act? No. Is it under the Quarantine Act? No. Is it under the Immigration Act? No. Which statute in this country gives this one man this power to refuse citizens to come back home when the Constitution says that no citizen must be banned from entering here? Show me where in law. And so we raise these things a little more. Now, what I'm told when citizens raise um, cases in the court, they run and they give them an exemption. So it's one here and one there and two there. And when that happens, the person, okay, finish the case. They wouldn't go forward. So you're not getting full judgments on the operation of the law. But I call some research to be done because I say, where is this man getting this power? I mean, it's a tremendous power for him to wake up in the morning and decide I'm signing off for Annie Roberts to come. But I'm blocking Jayanti. She can't come. Where is this power coming from? Because you must operate with legal power. So are you operating illegally by using the fear of death, which is what they've been doing since last year, to block people from coming home when everybody else can come home? Now, I am also being, I'm very concerned with this whole issue of immigration, and again, this one man, I think you call him the king, somebody call him the king, his majesty. Was it Rodney? Yeah. Arrogating in himself so much power. I am being told now, and we would have read it, the Venezuelans have their issue where uh, the year has gone. The law is very clear in the Immigration Act that the minister does have the jurisdiction to grant a permit, but it must not exceed 12 months. To grant a permit for the person to enter and or the persons already here to give them this permit, which is what they did a year ago to give them the permits, but those permits are now one year. They lasted for one year. What is Stuart Young going to do? Some reports have come to say that they're going to renew it. Well, you can't renew it, you know, go back and read the law. You'll have to go back and give them a new permit. But what frightens me, because this government is so hell-bent in winning elections by any means possible, is that under the law, a non-commonwealth citizen can come in here. And whatever period of stay, they can become a naturalized citizen. You know what's going to happen then? They can vote. So they've already been here one year. But when you read it, they could say they were there before that year they got the permit, as long as they were here. And the minister then has the power to say, hey, you've been here seven years, you know. We will naturalize you. You become a citizen by naturalization. You could vote. We have to keep our eyes on this. So next thing is 16, 20,000 Venice being naturalized over time, over time. So we have to really keep a, a, a hawk eye on what is happening with immigration. And these are just some of the matters. I want to talk a little about um, the Stranding Nationals. David, he spoke about the energy sector and the crisis in the energy sector and what has happened at NGC. So Caricris has now downgraded NGC. Okay, so what does that mean? What it means is the cost of borrowing and the payment of debts has increased. Will increase because of that downgrade. So you may say it's only one downgrade. But let's see what happens. It's very important then, MP Lee mentioned that NGC for the first time in its history recorded a loss under this rolling government. We have to know what did it turn up with at the end of 2020 because he spoke about uh, middle of the year. What has happened in the second half, the two further quarters? Have we operated at a loss again, which will take us further down on a downgrade? So the cost of borrowing is going to be increased. And when the cost of borrowing is increased, then it means that we are going to be paying more money in debt, interest, payment on loans. So we have to keep a real sharp eye as well on what's happening in the energy sector with NGC. MP Lee mentioned the uh, 24 plants that are going to be affected. And then this latest uh, central bank TT announcement, coupled with the NGC credit rating outlook by Carrie Chris. So those are some of the errors I would talk about. But we have to look at the poor fortunes of NGC in 2020 to get a wider view, a broader perspective. The question then will be this. 
What are the terms and conditions surrounding the agreement with Touchstone Exploration signed in December 2020? That agreement sees NGC enter into an agreement with Primera Oil and Gas Limited, a subsidiary of a Canadian energy company, Touchstone Exploration. What are the terms and conditions now, given this downgrade, and given what the central bank is saying, and given what Caricris is saying? Finally, tonight, budget, effect taking, budget measures taking effect now in this month, and I want to get back to something I will never let them forget procurement legislation. I will never let them forget it. We will not support them. I said it and I will repeat it. The UNC will isolate the government. We give them no support unless they come to their senses, unless they come and repeal those provisions in the amending bills to their um, procurement act, those provisions gutting out the procurement law, emasculating that law. I mentioned last week that we want to do a webinar. We are well on our way to planning. Tonight I want to announce we will do the webinar. We've had several people who are willing to come on board to speak on it. It will be on the 20th of January, which is next week, Wednesday, and we will have more details on that as we go along. So what did they do with the procurement law that we should not let them forget? They took out the oversight of the procurement regulator for matters dealing with legal services. Legal services. You know, last week I said, where are all these senior counsels and things? How come nobody have a word to say about the fact that you took out these legal services? Yeah, I said that last week, one of them come out to say, the UNC has a leader with no credibility. I have more credibility than you could ever have. We had 309,000 persons <laughs> voting for the UNC in the last election. So all these armchair politicians sitting down there, they don't have a word to say when this PNM is rubbing this country dry in broad daylight. But when people speak out against it, don't say nothing. We must be nice. We are nice people, but my niceness is done. Done. We will call a spade a spade where we see it. And it is very wrong <clears throat> for them to give exempt <coughs> legal legal services from the procurement regulations, from the oversight for that, because every time you file a question to ask about legal fees, they hide behind all kinds of stories and all kinds of exemptions. They don't want to do that, but they'll come every day to talk about Ann and Ram Logan and legal fees there. But this age, you will never disclose what those legal fees are, we'll find him in the courthouse one day and he will have to disclose the fees that he's been paid. They took out um, medical services, man. Medical from oversight. Why? You have an AG, AG recusing himself in the cabinet when matters relating to medical services came up. What is the business of the AG in medical services? What monies is he making? What are specific matters he recused himself for relating to medical services? So what did they do now? He did say in Parliament, yes, he has an interest in some medical something. By removing it from there, it allows his friends in the cabinet to grant contracts that he may or his family may benefit from, for medical services to be contracted to the government. You took out accounting issues. We talked about Stuart Young <clears throat> and the numerous times recused about things dealing with money, banking issues. <coughs> so bas basically, what they've done by removing all these things, they have put it in the hands of the cabinet. No, it's okay. They have put it in the hands of the cabinet to grant to themselves, their friends and family, contracts using taxpayers' dollars. And that is why I say we will not let them forget it. When we are finished with the webinar, we will launch a petition in this country against the gutting and emasculation of that procurement law. They must not get away with it. This is daylight robbery and tea free. Where it is, you don't have any oversight. You take out the most lucrative ones and you keep it for the cabinet, for the cabinet to grant it, you know. And who is the cabinet? The friends, all the friends sit around the table. I explained to you all before when one, when one walk out and say, I recuse, the next one say, yes, we agree to everything. When he comes back, the next one, outside. 
outside. It's left foot, right foot, Balija juice going on there. Left foot, right foot, they're playing. They're playing footsie with the taxpayers' monies. And we must not allow them to escape with that. They have come in narratives accusing the government island of all kinds of things. They come with some chopper, they had it parked up there six years, but they want to blame us. They want to blame us for six years, you have to park up, hiding up in Komoto. But you want to blame us. You go on down Australia, I talk it again. One trip to Australia, two boats coming up the road. What was the procurement process? Half a billion dollars. How did you decide you want this boat? What were its parts? What was happening last week? I told you about the defects. They say, well, small thing now. Minor business. Don't worry, we'll fix that. Well, we'll see. It's here now. We'll see what is fixed and what is not fixed. So as we go forward, let us remember you, I say election burnout. We have five by-elections, okay? On the 25th of January, five by-elections. Hindustan St. Mary's, Hollywood Dog in Point 14, Alice Glen, what is it, Juan Cuckoo, up in Deagle, Arima Central, and of course in Kunupia. What does it mean? Others have told you. We have to say to the PNM, no to property tax. We have to say to the PNM, no to cutting out the procurement law. We have to say to the PNM, no to the shutting down of businesses, no to keeping our national standard abroad. Let's send that message, message that whatever they are doing, it's not good enough. It wouldn't change the government, but it will send a strong message that we are very dissatisfied with their incompetence and with the manner in which they are running this country as dictators. We change that. We will change it again. They might be in their safe ground and feel they, everything is fine. They are okay making their rentals and so on, making whatever it is. But we have to tell them no. And if we stay home on the 25th and you allow them to do that, what next will they do? How much more will they do? They're so brass and bold-faced to come in a parliament. And when we thought the independent senators would have stood up for what was right. And when you talk about, you mustn't talk about them, you know. They could say anything they want. You mustn't talk about these people. When the whole country, the NGOs, the business community say, no, do not do that with the procurement law. You have the independent centers, they might bring a motion against me in the parliament too. But, but, we have freedom of expression. They must have freedom of expression, but the UNC mustn't have none. We mustn't have that. But I say to them, no. When we thought that right-thinking people would have said no to this wicked piece of law with the procurement legislation, half people went and voted for that boy. Now, I don't know. I'm not talking about who voted and didn't vote. But you, know, you really have to wonder if there's a vested interest. You really have to wonder if there's a quid pro quo, that there's a benefit to come, and only time will tell us I'm accusing no one. But only time will tell as we go down the road and time longer than twine. We will find out. We will find out what it is that this wicked government is up to. And so we go to Parliament tomorrow. They bring a giant to tell you this evidence amendment bill. When they brought it before, it needed a special majority. They're bringing it back tomorrow. They've removed the special majority. So the same thing will happen as happened with the procurement, with a simple majority, they get one or two from the independents, and they pass it. They did it with other pieces of law. I hear they want to bring back the bail bill with the same kind of provision, take out the special majority, so it's only them and them alone will vote. But the parliament doesn't work like that. You will get away with it today, but there's tomorrow that will come that you will be challenged. And I'm glad you reminded us tonight. When I told Faris in the parliament, when he came with a notice, to appoint a commissioner of police, to appoint, to set out a process, the order, steps to take, and so on. And we told him, well, you can't do that. And he come again with Northern Construction. <laughs> that man, like he knows, only have one court case. Northern Construction. And there's a second one, he always you, I'd say, proportionate and legitimate, and blah, 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 blah. Well, we went to court and we butts this deal. He got a cut skin in the courthouse. So whilst we may be praying now and saying and bringing these things to the fore, as I say, every rope has an end. 
And whilst you think you could fool people for today and remove the special majority provisions, you will get caught out in the courthouse. May take a little time, but that's what the law is about. And all this attack on lawyers, man. You have no shame and respect for yourself, Faris. You're a lawyer. So you're young, you're a lawyer. You have no shame and respect for yourself. And the other half lawyers you all have. No shame, no respect for anybody in this country. So anybody who speaks against them, they attack and vilify and demonize. I say we must now stand up. United we stand and together we can. United we stand and together we can. They cannot fight all of us. They cannot take down everyone. And so when they vilify one, we must get up and stand up for what is right. Chunk it again, I say you're a hero. They will probably hate you, but you were right. You were right and the others were there. Others will come. So we will have to say, united we stand, together we can. If we join together, you know they say, if you take one finger and you try to push down a man, you can't push him down, you know. You take two maybe, but when you take the whole fist, you can have a more powerful punch. So tonight I ask you to remember that on the 25th. Go out on the 25th. Vote for your candidate in Hindustan, St. Mary's. Vote for your candidate in Kunupia. Vote for your candidate in Hollywood. Vote for your candidate in Arima and so on. But how are you voting? Put your ex next to the rising sun. So we say vote for Lakis and vote for Richard Sukhdev. Vote for all the candidates. But remember, when you get in there, you're looking for something. That's why we have symbols. You're looking for the rising sun. And let us make it happen together. Enough is enough. I say good night. God bless you. And God bless Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much.